In 1904, the famous scholar and translator, Basil Hall Chamberlain, wrote that he felt 400 years old. He was, in fact, only 54, but he was referring to his recent experiences in Japan. Chamberlain had come to Japan in 1873, just five years after the fall of the Tokugawa Shogunate in 1868. And over the following decades, he had witnessed a breakneck pace of change. He said it was as though he had arrived in Japan during the Middle Ages, but found himself just 30 years later in modern times. For example, Chamberlain described how, when he first arrived, he had learned Japanese from a samurai who carried two swords and wore his hair in a topknot. That was the traditional samurai haircut, with the front of the head shaved and the longer hair in the back and the sides gathered and dressed in a queue. But in 1904, such men were long gone. Now, Chamberlain's description of jumping from the Middle Ages to modern times was an exaggeration. But he was describing something very real. In fact, Let's play with Chamberlain's approach for just a moment, but let's stretch his dates just a little. Let's go back an extra five years to 1868 to include the last days of Tokugawa rule, and let's add one year at the other end to include Japan's victory in the Russo-Japanese War of 1905. So, in 1868, Japan had virtually no railroads or steam engines and no telegraph capacity to speak of. In 1905, by contrast, it defeated one of the world's greatest military powers with its state-of-the-art navy, and railroads and telegraph lines crisscrossed the country. In 1868, the samurai were still a hereditary warrior class. Commoners were banned from possessing serious weapons. But in 1905, Japan's army was full of conscripted farm boys, and some of the heroes of the Russo-Japanese War were local kids, many of whom had never left their villages before they were drafted. Or how about this? In 1868, public discussion of politics was effectively illegal. Government affairs were the business of samurai, and commoners were not supposed to question their decisions. In fact, even directly reporting the news could be punished as a crime. But by 1905, dozens of daily newspapers reported on local and world affairs. And this press was often brutally critical of the government. They exposed corruption. They complained about taxes. Some insisted that Japan was too meek internationally. Others said it was too aggressive. And there was an elected national assembly called the Diet. It was full of elected commoners. And they were even more critical of the government because while newspapers could be shut down for libel, Diet members enjoyed complete freedom of speech. So this was an astonishing piece of change, and it was also far-reaching. Everything from tangible items, like clothing and food and hairstyles, to things like the law and business and the army, and, and abstract questions like, what is religion? And are there things called human rights? In all these areas, we see an enormous, radical transformation between 1868 and 1905. So here's the big question, why? Why did this happen? Well, in large measure, these changes were driven by Japan's most recent cycle of globalization, Globalization Stage 3. And just as with its two earlier stages, Japan changed radically in order to adjust to a new global environment, new opportunities, 
and new challenges. So what was new in the environment in the late 1800s? What prompted these radical changes? Well, quite frankly, seen from Japan, the world was terrifying. The world was quickly being divided into two camps, the colonizers and the colonized. Virtually all the European powers had colonial empires. And this was not just the major powers like England and France, but also Italy and Belgium and Holland. And much of the Asian world was either already colonized or in the process of being colonized. India, Vietnam, Cambodia, Indonesia. And after the 1840s, the Western powers even began peeling off parts of China, like Hong Kong as colonial outposts. Now the Tokugawa shogunate was completely unprepared to meet this challenge. And it's tempting to say that the Tokugawa shogunate was weak, because it had no army or navy capable of pushing back against these aggressive powers. But remember, the Tokugawa had let their army decay for a reason. They had worked carefully for hundreds of years to create an international environment where the regime could be safe without an army. Japan and Korea and China had all agreed to stay out of each other's way. So Tokugawa weakness wasn't an accident. It was part of a plan not to need an army. But the Western powers broke that system. These Westerners just kept grabbing stuff. Clearly, they were not interested in staying out of each other's way in the interests of peace. So from at least the 1840s, with the defeat of China in the Opium Wars, it was clear that the shogun needed to do something. It needed new weapons and new military organization. But the institution was internally paralyzed. Even after Commodore Perry humiliated the shogunate in 1853, the vested interests against reform were just too strong. For example, one of the key problems of the shogunate military was that it relied on hundreds of different daimyo armies. Those now needed to be consolidated into one centralized command. But here's the problem. The shogun's high-ranking officers themselves were daimyo. The men who needed to dissolve the daimyo armies were the daimyo. That is, the very men who held power would have to voluntarily surrender that power. And what about mobilizing commoners? To create a modern army that relied on the whole country instead of just a hereditary elite. Well, that sounds great unless your government is staffed entirely by samurai who are that hereditary elite and who all might be replaced by commoners. So what was Japan to do? Well, in this environment, certain reform-minded politicians, intellectuals, and activists began looking for a way to break with the unsustainable status quo. And in order to move forwards, they looked backwards to imperial rule. Now, historians refer to this reform movement as the Meiji Restoration. And it's easy to define the start of the Meiji Restoration, the overthrow of the Tokugawa house in early 1868. And it's also easy to point to the major reforms of the Meiji Restoration, the abolition of hereditary status distinctions, the abolition of the samurai class, the creation of a conscript army and navy, the restructuring of land ownership and taxation, the creation of a new educational system with mandatory primary education at the bottom and Western-style universities at the top. But it's a bit harder to say when the restoration ends. Maybe in 1873, because all of those reforms were announced by 1873. Or maybe 1878, because many of those reforms did not take effect nationwide until about 1878. 
Or we could argue that the restoration ends with some later accomplishments, such as the new constitution of 1889, or nationwide elections to the Diet in 1890, or even the end of the Russo-Japanese War in 1905. That was when Japan completed the shift from a potentially colonized country to a colonizing power. But however we define the endpoint of the Meiji Restoration, a central idea was the restoration of imperial power. And that's remarkable because the imperial house had not done much of anything in a millennium. The last time the emperor commanded an army was the 700s. The imperial tax collection system was defunct by the 800s. And since the early 1600s, the emperor's duties had been formally reduced to simple ceremonial functions. But that complete disconnect from practical affairs, that was actually part of the emperor's appeal to major reformers. Because whatever had gone wrong in the Tokugawa period, it wasn't the emperor's fault. Imperial authority was unsullied by the inability of samurai to respond to Western imperialism. Now, scholars are still amazed by the astonishing smoothness of the major restoration. True, it wasn't entirely peaceful, but it was a picnic compared to the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution or the Chinese Revolution. Adding up all the domestic casualties from fighting in Japan, from the 1850s through to the 1870s, we get tens of thousands, not millions. And that's largely because the Meiji Restoration didn't pose a stark contrast of ideologies, monarchy versus democracy, or capitalism versus communism. Instead, it was a battle for who would implement radical reform in the name of the emperor. So while there were bitter power struggles, it wasn't the sort of clash of ideologies that would tear a country apart. I often ask my students to guess what happened to the last shogun, Tokugawa Yoshinobu. And they usually assume that he died an ugly death soon after his fall from power in 1868. And that's not a bad guess, because Yoshinobu was vilified by his enemies. They described him as a traitor to the emperor and a traitor to Japan. And if you imagine the major restoration as a battle between old ways and new ways, well then, certainly the last shogun must have died defending the old ways, right? So you can assume he was executed, right? No, no, that's completely wrong. Yoshinobu did not die on the gallows, he didn't commit seppuku, he wasn't even thrown in jail. He died in 1913, at the ripe old age of 75, rather wealthy and fully restored to respectability. At his death, he had recently stepped down from the Japanese House of Peers. And that's because there wasn't any point in killing Yoshinobu because by the time he resigned as shogun, he was basically dissolving the old order on his own. So when Yoshinobu agreed to quietly get out of the way, there really wasn't much to fight about. And some of the shogun's most prominent advisors rather easily switched sides to the new government. And that's a key insight into the major restoration, the relative absence of a clash between old and new. In fact, we see lots of the opposite, the intersection of the old and new, rather than a direct clash, the complementarity of the Japanese and the Western. So while it's common to say that in the Meiji period, Japan modernized and westernized, I prefer a more subtle phrasing. Japan reformed so as to look powerful and legitimate in a modern Western world. Meiji reforms weren't about making Japan more Western, but about developing a Western-oriented way of being Japanese. Now that may sound like an arcane difference, 
But since a picture is worth a thousand words, let's consider a specific image. One of the many things the new Japanese government developed was a national currency. Yes, prior to the Meiji Restoration, there was paper money in Japan, hundreds of different kinds of money issued by different daimyo and shrines and temples. But none of it was Japanese national money. It was just different entities within Japan issuing their own private money. The Meiji government found that situation intolerable. So they commissioned some modern, state-of-the-art national money from a modern, state-of-the-art printer, the Continental Banknote Company in the U.S. Remember Ito Hirobumi's speech in Washington? Well, Ito recommended that Japan copy the U.S. currency system. And the result was that Japan's 1873 paper money looks remarkably like U.S. money from the 1860s. For example, if you compare a 10 yen note to a $10 bill, you can see that the general design is the same. The value of the note is printed in the four corners of the bill, there's a large tableau image in the middle, and there are paired medallions on the left and the right of the tableau. It's as if the Japanese government just said, these bills look great, just change the dollars to yen and start printing. So this seems simple, right? Japan copied the US, and so the new printed money is Western and modern. But it wasn't that simple. Because in copying the US banknotes, the Japanese government was also celebrating ancient Japanese imperial rule. So returning to the $10 bill from the 1860s, the tableau is a version of the 19th century painting from the Capitol Rotunda called The Discovery of the Mississippi by De Soto. And it shows Hernando De Soto astride a white horse, his armor gleaming, brave troops at his side, riding in front of half-naked Native Americans, and in the foreground, priests and soldiers are erecting a cross. These visuals aren't subtle. This is manifest destiny in a painting. White Christians were destined to conquer the new world, to bring civilization and religion to naked savages. The conquest of the new world was divinely ordained. Now, the Japanese government obviously did not include Hernando de Soto on their 10 yen notes. But they did choose an intriguingly analogous image, a picture of the legendary Empress Jingu and her legendary conquest of Korea in the 200s. And that's basically a Japanese equivalent of Manifest Destiny. You see, according to Japanese mythology, the gods ordered Empress Jingu to conquer the Korean kingdom of Shiragi and her conquest was magical. She was pregnant, but she put stones in her womb to delay childbirth until she could defeat Shiragi. And her son, the next emperor, he cooperatively agreed not to be born until she was done fighting. Although he did help direct battles from inside his mother's womb. So the connection between the $10 note and the 10 yen note is thematically significant. Just as 19th century Americans thought that God had given the American West to them, so the major government believed that their gods had given the Korean Peninsula to them. So this is an imported Western technology used to tell the story of an ancient Japanese legend, Empress Jingu matches Manifest Destiny. Now, I don't want to read too much into a single picture, but this one is indeed worth a thousand words because Japan's colonial conquest of Korea was in fact based on European models of colonial discourse. The new Meiji government abandoned the old Tokugawa model in which 
Japanese-Korean relations were kept both distant and vague. Instead, they insisted on a Western model of colonizers and colonized. From the very beginning in the 1870s, the Japanese employed Western advisors to make sure that their colonial claims on Korea made sense in London and Paris and Washington, D.C. They didn't look back and argue that Toyotomi Hideyoshi had invaded in 1592, and so now it was time to finish the job. Instead, they used modern terms like protectorate and sphere of influence. Japan drew explicit parallels between U.S. interests in the Philippines and Japanese interests in Korea, also between French interests in Indochina and Japanese interests in Korea. This wasn't some crazy territorial grab. This was carefully justified in diplomatic memos, which framed the entire first stage of Japanese imperialism as a counterpart to Western imperialism. And by 1905, the great powers accepted Japan as the new junior member of the imperialist club. So, while it's tempting to think about the Meiji Restoration as this epic battle between the old and the new, or between Japanese tradition and new Western ways, it's actually much more interesting to look at how the government embraced foreign practices while also incorporating Japanese traditions like the legend of Empress Jingu. Let me give you another example of how new Western ideas were actually combined with ancient Japanese practice. The creation of the modern Japanese army. The abolition of the samurai class and the creation of the modern Japanese army, those were one of the most momentous reforms of the Meiji era. The samurai class was dismantled by a series of edicts in the 1870s. And the government also abolished all hereditary restrictions on employment so that Japanese commoners could now join the military. In fact, the government instituted a draft. So the abolition of the samurai class and the conscription of commoners, that was the end of a Japanese tradition, right? A clear case of modern Western ideas triumphing over Japanese tradition, right? Well, not so much. At least not according to the government edict announcing conscription. In that edict, the government insisted that conscription was not a break with tradition. It was actually the restoration of Japan's true tradition. The edict claimed that in the 700s, the emperor had been the commander of a conscript army, and that during military crises, the emperor had led his people from the highest minister to the ordinary farmer as the head of a national army. Now, that was a rather romantic view of ancient conscription. At the time, being drafted probably felt more like slave labor than noble service to most 8th century Japanese farmers. But the government was right on one basic fact, because at least on paper, the ancient imperial state had a conscript army. And that ancient precedent allowed the Meiji government to attack the, tr the tradition of samurai rule as not traditional at all. On the contrary, the samurai were interlopers. Their rise to power had been a symptom of the decline of the imperial house. So now, in the 1870s, Japan was actually returning to the real, ancient tradition. Japan was skipping right past all that messy so-called tradition, those centuries of samurai rule, and going right back to the true tradition of the 700s. So conscription was supposedly a return to ancient ways. But it was also modern and Western. In fact, the government declared that they had abolished the samurai class in the name of equal rights and equal duties for all Japanese. Now, if equal rights sounds like a distinctly modern Western concept, that's because it is. 
But for Japanese reformers of the 1870s, that modern Western concept dovetailed perfectly with their aims. And this dovetailing allowed the government to assert that by creating a modern Western army, they were actually restoring Japan's most ancient practices. Okay, here's a final example. Let's move from geopolitics to public ceremonies. The Japanese emperor was thought to be uniquely descended from the ancient gods by an unbroken line of descent going back to the 7th century BCE. So, what could be more traditional than showing the emperor to the Japanese people? Showing the emperor would be reminding them of their traditions, right? Well, actually, no, not at all. By long-standing practice, only a handful of people, courtiers of extremely high rank, ever met the emperor. Remember how when the emperor wanted to see that elephant in the 1700s, the elephant needed to get high court rank? Now, the leaders of the major restoration thought that such remoteness made the emperor a lousy symbol of national unity. They wanted a modern monarch, one, yes, with an ancient pedigree, but modern. Because the name of the game was to look powerful and civilized in a world dominated by Western norms. And European kings and queens, they weren't remote and untouchable. They participated in all sorts of public ceremonies. They convened parliaments, they cut ribbons, they christened ships. Everyone knew what they looked like, and that was part of their power. So the Meiji reformers decided that it was time to show off the Japanese emperor. And they sent the Meiji emperor and empress around the country in completely unprecedented fashion. They visited textile mills and schools. They attended the opening of railroad lines. And they met ordinary people, mayors and soldiers and scholars and businessmen, people without any special rank. If you look at where the Meiji emperor stayed in the 1870s, it was often just the spruced up wing of an ordinary inn. There are Meiji Emperor Stayed Here plaques in remarkably ordinary places. Now, by the 1880s, the government eased up on these visits. They didn't want the emperor overexposed. But they still wanted him in the public eye. And they wanted European royals to think of the Meiji Emperor as part of their club. So in 1894, the government promoted massive nationwide events and huge public celebrations of the occasion of the silver wedding anniversary of the emperor and the empress. There were special postcards, there were special postage stamps. The government even struck medals which were given to those who attended the ceremony. But in planning this event, the imperial house had trouble with one key question. When exactly was the emperor's wedding anniversary? Nobody knew. And that's because commemorating an exact wedding day was unknown in Japan before the Meiji period. In fact, the entire celebration of wedding anniversaries was unprecedented in Japanese history. Japan had never celebrated an imperial wedding anniversary before. The idea arose because European heads of state had massive public celebrations for their anniversaries. So, of course, Japan, as a civilized country, needed one as well. So, if we think of the imperial institution as uniquely Japanese and ancient, in contrast to modern and Western, those huge nationwide celebrations make no sense because they were both. They were brand new ways of celebrating an ancient institution. And that's the ongoing legacy of the Meiji Restoration. The synthesis of the ancient and the modern, of the new and the traditional, of the local and the global, that synthesis was deliberately crafted by the Meiji government. And it remains a distinctive characteristic 
of Japan today.